All right. Well, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been following along this month, you know that we have been diving deep into extreme environments. So uh, places on earth that are hard to get to, places where it's hard for life to exist. And then we've been talking to scientists and explorers who've made it their mission to get to these places for their research, for the media they like to collect, and then bring it back to us in locations that maybe aren't quite so extreme. So we're really excited for today's event. We've got classrooms joining us uh, from all across North America, both on camera and on YouTube. If you're joining us on YouTube today, don't forget that you can still get in on the action. There's a chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from and send us some questions and we'll work those in. And as always, whether you're joining us on camera or you're on YouTube, take some pictures, post them to Twitter, hashtag explore classroom, tag at Nat Geo Education. We'd love to see pictures of classrooms in action. All right, let's meet our guest for today. Uh, Nazir Ibrahim is a German Moroccan paleontologist, a postdoctoral scholar in vertebrate anatomy and paleontology at the University of Chicago. He scours the deserts of North Africa for clues to life in the Cretaceous period when the area was a large river system teeming with a profusion of biodiversity of different kinds of life. In addition to finding one of the most complete skeletons the Spinosaur. He's also unearthed huge dinosaur bones, discovered fossil footprints, as well as a new species of flying reptile with an 18 foot wingspan that lived over 95 million years ago. So with this theme being extreme environments, I would say the deserts of Northern Africa definitely uh, apply. Nizar, it's so great to have you joining us live today. We're excited to get to know you a little better. Thanks for having me. And hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start with a, uh, a brief introduction um, and then uh, we'll have some time for questions. Um, so uh, yes, I'm a paleontologist and a comparative anatomist. I'm actually joining you uh, today, not from Chicago, but from Michigan in the comparative anatomy and paleontology lab. So you can see some skeletons behind me. Um, much of my work is about reconstructing the anatomy of animals, both living and extinct, but mostly extinct. And uh, to do that, I uh, have first to collect fossils. And I collect fossils in one of the most inhospitable places in the world, the Sahara Desert. So how do it, did I get there? Uh, why did I decide to go to the Sahara? Um, I'll tell you all about it. Let me just share my screen. And all right. So can you see my screen all right? Yeah, looks good. Fantastic. All right. So um, I'm a paleontologist, but I sometimes describe myself as a, a, a time traveler because I get to explore incredible places, places like this one here, um, a strange ecosystem uh, with bizarre creatures that look like something out of a science fiction uh, movie, something like Star Wars or Avatar. Um, and I get to explore these places by traveling back in time um, uh, into the deep past of planet Earth. Now, I spend much of my time um, scouring the shifting sands of the Sahara Desert in search of fossils. Um, the Sahara is a very, very big place, as you'll find out in a moment. And it is a very difficult place to work in. But I've been there many times. I even take students out there. So this picture here was taken just a few weeks ago um, when I brought students to the Sahara. Um, we're actually there in July. So uh, it was very, very hot. The students had to cope with extreme temperatures. You know, it was 120 Fahrenheit. Um, they had to climb up mountains. Um, and you can see them there resting after climbing up a, a steep escarpment uh, in search of fossils. And uh, People often ask me, well, you know, how do you get there? How do you become a paleontologist hunting for fossils in the Sahara? Um, we know how, you know, you can become a lawyer or a policeman or a doctor. How do you become a paleontologist? And so um, I'll tell you my story and how I ended up exploring the Sahara. So my, my interest in uh, paleontology began at a very early age when I was five or six years old, maybe even a little earlier. And it began with a love for animals. 
So I, I loved all animals, living and extinct. So live snakes or, you know, dinosaurs. I just thought all animals were amazing. Uh, and I was um, very eager to, to learn more about their anatomy, their evolution, their behavior. And um, at around that time, I also got a book um, just on extinct animals. And when I looked at those animals, creatures like Triceratops here, I was hooked. I thought, you know, these animals are absolutely spectacular. They really push the boundaries of what's possible, um, you know, in size and, and, you know, they're just so spectacular. You have animals um, like Triceratops with giant horns and frills. You have um, ferocious predators. And so I thought, you know what? If I'm going to study animals, um, I'll spend a lot of time studying extinct animals because they are really absolutely spectacular. And if you had asked me at the time what kind of a pet animal I would like, I probably would have said a baby T-Rex like this one here. Um, that's uh, who I was when I was young. I was just crazy about animals and dinosaurs were particularly interesting to me. Now, at the time, I didn't really know um, that much about the field of paleontology. I thought, well, paleontologists go out and dig for fossils, right? But they do much more than that. Um, so I found out, for example, that paleontologists um, do not just work on extinct animals. They also look at living animals, like this very well-behaved live alligator here. This alligator is called Lucky. Um, and it turns out that paleontologists look at living animals, because if you want to understand extinct ones, you kind of have to look at living ones. So, for example, if you want to reconstruct the muscles and the skin um, of a dinosaur like this one here, you have to understand muscles and skin in living animals, right? So we look at living animals um, and we learn a lot about their anatomy, and then we kind of transfer that knowledge to the bones we have of extinct animals. So what that means is that many paleontologists are actually really good anatomists. So anatomy is the structure of the body, not just a human body, but also the body of other animals. Um, and so, you know, this here is a piece of research um, from a paper I published with colleagues. Um, and we looked at the anatomy of the human hand. So it turns out that paleontologists like myself, working mostly on dinosaurs and other extinct animals, um, sometimes also do research on humans and are quite knowledgeable about human anatomy. So I actually teach human anatomy at the moment. I teach future, um, you know, dentists and, and nurses and nurse practitioners um, human anatomy. So I learned that anatomy is a really big part of being a paleontologist. Another thing I learned was that paleontologists don't just look at, um, you know, a spectacular dinosaur uh, typically, they try to reconstruct an entire ecosystem. So ecology is also a really important part of being a paleontologist. Um, ultimately, what you're trying to do is you're trying to reconstruct an entire ecosystem, the world that these animals lived in. And you might say, well, why do we need to, to understand ecosystems from the deep past of our planet? Well, here's why. If you want to understand how ecosystems on our planet work today and how they're going to change over time, for example, because the climate changes or because we're um, killing off many animals and plants, causing extinctions, if you want to understand what the consequences of these things are, then you can look at extinct ecosystems. Extinct ecosystems have gone through extinction events and changes in climate. So basically understanding the past really helps us understand the present and predict the future. Now, so armed with all of this knowledge, I decided to um, become a paleontologist, uh, help piece together this incredible story, the story of life on earth, which you can see here. It's an incredible story, um, a story full of incredible creatures and ecosystems. So I was really, really excited about piecing together this incredible story. Um, when you look at this story, you can make some pretty incredible discoveries uh, because you can find out more about the origins of some groups that are still around today. So 
You might ask, for example, where did mammals come from? Or humans, when did the first mammals appear on Earth? Or you might say, where did birds come from? Well, if we try to answer the question of where birds came from, um, look at this thing here. This bizarre creature is a feathered dinosaur. And we now know that feathers first appeared in dinosaurs. So if you like, dinosaurs invented feathers and they did not evolve for flight at first. They may have appeared for insulation, so to keep the animal warm. Uh, maybe uh, they were used to make the animal look uh, bigger and prettier, a bit like a peacock's tail, but they were not used for flight. This thing here could not fly. So, um, so paleontology allows us to not just piece together this story, but we can also look at really cool things like the origin of birds. We now know that birds, and that includes pigeons and chickens, um, are surviving dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. So even the mighty T-Rex may have been, at least in part, feathered, which is pretty cool. All right, so now that I had learned more about paleontology, I decided to collect fossils, you know, go out there and discover fossils, and I had to pick a, a good spot, right? And I thought, well, we know many dinosaurs from the United States, like Triceratops or T-Rex or Stegosaurus. Um, we know quite a few dinosaurs from Europe and Asia, but we know very little about Africa's dinosaurs. So I decided to go to Africa and see the yellowish uh, portion of Africa. You can see there um, the upper portion of the African continent. That's the Sahara Desert. It's a really, really big desert. It's about the size of the United States. And I decided to go there um, and explore this desert. In particular, this region here, which is marked in red, the Kem Kem region in the border um, area between Morocco and Algeria. And this is what the Sahara Desert looks like. It's a really challenging place to work in. As Joe said earlier on, it's an extreme environment. It's a very hostile place. Um, and it's really hard for animals and plants to survive there. You encounter some animals there. This is one example. Uh, this is a really cool reptile, um, Euromastix, a kind of big lizard, uh, but you also encounter uh, many venomous snakes and scorpions. So you really have to be careful when you're out there um, because there are no hospitals out there in the Sahara. Uh, sometimes you experience sandstorms. Sometimes you even experience flooding. What you see here is flooding in the desert. Just imagine that. Even the Sahara Desert can flood sometimes. Um, it can also be a dangerous place. There are no police stations in the Sahara Desert. So sometimes we need uh, protection, a military escort. So these soldiers are there to protect us from bandits and other armed groups. So those are all reasons why it is really challenging to work in the Sahara. Um, but here's another challenge I faced. So when I decided to explore the Sahara, um, I was very young. And some people told me, oh, don't bother going there. You're probably not gonna find anything. It's really difficult to find fossils there. And basically they were telling me, you know, don't go. And I didn't have any experience. I'd never led an expedition to the Sahara. Um, but sometimes you just really have to believe in yourself. And I knew that I could pull it off. And so I did put together an expedition team and we explored the Sahara. And guess what? We found incredible things. This is one of the fossils we found. We found thousands of incredible fossils, but I always like to show this one here. This is the upper arm bone or part of the upper arm bone of a very, very big plant eating dinosaur. This plant eating dinosaur would have weighed about 60 tons. That's about the weight of an entire herd of elephants. So really, really big, long-necked, long-tailed plant-eating dinosaur, a little bit like the Plodocus. And we found many other things. We found remains of giant fish. This fish here is the size of a car. It's the size of an SUV. Uh, so that's really weird, right? You find a fish in a desert. Um, well, we found fish scales and bones in the desert because a long, long time ago, 100 million years ago, which is when these animals were alive, this was a river system. So the Sahara was a place full of water 
It was home to giant fish and crocodiles and flying reptiles. This is another animal we found. This is a pterosaur, a flying reptile. This is not a bird, it's not a bat. It's an absolutely unique flying creature. And this thing here is a 25 foot wingspan. It's a really spectacular animal. So we had found fish, crocs, flying reptiles, dinosaurs. Probably the most spectacular animal we uncovered was a predatory dinosaur called Spinosaurus. This was a dinosaur bigger than T-Rex. This was the longest predatory dinosaur. It had long slender jaws like a crocodile. It had a giant sail on its back. And it was probably a fish eating dinosaur. So really, really strange animal. And we're very excited about this animal. This was one of our um, key discoveries. So when you put all of this information together, you can paint a vivid picture, right? So this is the Sahara today. Um, but if we could travel back in time, 100 million years into the past, we would see something very different. We would see this big river system swarming with fish and crocs and flying reptiles. And of course, dinosaurs walking around on the edge of this ancient ecosystem. So very, very, very different from the Sahara today. So that's what I mean when I say I can be a time traveler. I can go to a place like the Sahara, and then when I travel back in time, I see something very, very, very different. I also found out that paleontology is not just about piecing together bones and reconstructing ancient worlds. Paleontology also involves cutting edge technology sometimes. So when we reconstruct the anatomy of a dinosaur, we sometimes use really cool modern technology. So here's one example. This here is the snout of a predatory dinosaur and we put it through a CT scanner. So a CT scanner is something you might see in a hospital and it allows you to look inside a body or in this case, inside a bone. So we can actually look at the openings inside the bone for blood vessels and nerves. We can reconstruct all the details um, of the inside of the snout of a dinosaur. Here's another example of using cutting edge technology. This is a digital skeleton, a digital skeleton of a dinosaur, building a dinosaur skeleton in a computer. Um, this is another thing we now do. So we can actually animate the skeleton. Look how a dinosaur moved, for example. So paleontology is not just old dusty bones. It's also cutting edge technology. Um, the other thing I learned about paleontology is that it is a very um, diverse field. You know, you use anatomy, the study, the structure of the body, you use biology, the study of life geology, the study of rocks, which is where fossils are found. You also work with um, artists. They create the artwork, the drawings you saw. Uh, you work with museum specialists. This here's an image from a, an early sketch for an exhibit we put together. This was an exhibit um, where people could come face to face with Spinosaurus and other extinct creatures we uncovered. So that's another thing I really love about my job. I get to work with people from many, many different backgrounds. So you don't have to be a paleontologist to work on dinosaurs. You can be a computer animator or a museum specialist. There are many, many different uh, pathways. Now, the last thing I want to tell you before I um, take your questions is that um, our work in the Sahara is still very much ongoing. And we found some very, very, very exciting things there over the last couple of years. And we have some really exciting announcements. Um, so the, the scientific papers describing our new discoveries um, uh, are going to be submitted soon. Some of them have already been submitted. Um, so there'll be some really exciting news coming out over the next um, uh, few months, over the next year. So stay tuned and you'll find out more about um, our work in the Sahara, uh, one of the most inhospitable places on the planet uh, but as you now know, 100 million years ago, it was a river system full of dinosaurs and other spectacular extinct creatures. All right. And now I'm 
all yours, ready for your questions. All right. Awesome, Izar. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thanks for taking us back uh, around 100 million years ago to see the Sahara in a very different way from the extreme environment that uh, it is today. All right. So, Nizar, you should be able to... Yeah, I'll do the uh, stop share. Yep. Yeah, there you are. We got gotcha. you. Perfect. Well, I think it's time we meet some of our classrooms. And I want to give a shout out to our YouTube classrooms. Don't forget that if you use the chat sidebar on the right, you can send us in some questions. And I'll shout out to a couple classrooms there right now. Uh, Mrs. Schmidt's second graders are joining us right now. Oh, Mrs. Lumbergs are there too. Uh, we've got a class hanging out with us in St. Louis, Missouri. We've got a sixth grade class with Mrs. Finch. Their science class is hanging out with us today. Uh, so we've got lots of classrooms tuning in. Oh, another one in Georgia. So lots of uh, classrooms hanging out with us in uh, Tukoa, Georgia. Very cool. So let's take a question from our live classrooms. We're going to start off with Mrs. Hugs group. They are in Guelph, Ontario in Canada. Some fifth graders. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing fifth graders? All right, I see some cool anatomy posters in the background. Awesome. Who's got a question for us today? Jack has a question. Jack, how do you know if you find a bone? How do you know it's like, like a stegosaurus? Is that bone that you found? Oh, okay, that. so how, so if you, when you find a bone, how do you know uh, what dinosaur it belongs to is basically what you're asking, right? So um, here's what we do. When we find a bone, we... Uh, compare it to other bones that have been found before. And so I might go to a museum collection and go like, um, hmm, you know, do they have a bone that looks like the bone I found? And if I find something similar, uh, maybe I will say, oh, look, you know, what I found is actually a leg bone of a stegosaurus, right? Um, but if it looks different from all the other bones, um, then maybe it's something new. Maybe it's a new species of dinosaur. So basically what we do is we make detailed comparisons um, to, to identify bones. All right, so it's a little bit of detective work then. Yeah. Okay, see what it matches up with, but then uh, if it's not matching up, you might have something pretty cool in your hands. All right, let's go to Louisiana this time. We've got some classrooms. Uh, we're gonna go to Mrs. Gilpin's group. They are in Zachary, Louisiana. Let's get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, boys and girls? Yay! All right. Cool looking group of kids. What question do you have for us, bud? Why do, why do spies horses have sails? I mean, I know it's, I know like it's the whole point of the Spinosaurus. Like, it's weird. Like, it's called a Spinosaurus, but like it's called a Spinosaurus, but why does its spine stick out? Right, that's a very good question. Um, Spinosaurus really is a bizarre dinosaur, you know? I mean, um, if we didn't have the bones, I would say, you know, most paleontologists would probably say like, you know, such a creature would not, you know, could not possibly exist. You know, why would you have such a giant sail? But we know this animal existed. We found the bones. So we have to figure out what the sail was used for. And we think that the sail was used um, to make the animal look bigger, um, maybe it was used to tell other Spinosaurus, you know, look at me, look at how big I am. Uh, maybe it was used to attract a mate, like a peacock's tail. You know, a peacock has a giant tail. Um, so we think that there was something that we call a display structure, something to make the animal look really spectacular. Um, maybe it also had another function. Some people have suggested that it was used to control the temperature of the Spinosaurus, so like a giant solar panel so it could actually um, uh, warm the animal up when it was in the water but it's very difficult to prove that so this is still um, you know an, an, an ongoing question we're still trying to figure out what functions the sail had it probably had more than one function all right let's take a little visit to youtube and Nizar, i'm going to hit you with two questions from youtube the first one is from st louis missouri they're wondering uh, how many fossils you think you've collected uh, over, you know, your whole career? And then Finch's science group is wondering what, what kind of rocks do you look for uh, uh, when you're looking for fossils? 
Okay. Um, how many fossils? That's a tough one. Uh, thousands and thousands of fossils. Um, I know that some of the things we found are, are actually numbered in a collection. So I would probably take a, you know, very rough estimate and say it's certainly more than 10,000. Um, and uh, what kinds of rocks are we looking for? So we look at geological maps. And so we look of, for rocks of the right age. In, in, in the Sahara, we look for rocks that are about 100 million years old. And we look for rocks that were deposited in this ancient river system. Um, sometimes we work in other environments. So I'll show you one example. Um, this summer, we also explored a, a, a dig site um, where the rocks were laid down um, in a warm, shallow sea. And so this is a little piece. This is from the Sahara. I don't know if you can see this. See this little thing there? It's a little fish. Can you recognize this as a fish? The darker thing? Yeah. So this is a little piece from a mountain in the Sahara. Um, and you can kind of see the layering here. There are lots of layers here. So this was deposited in a warm, shallow sea. There's a very different kind of environment, not a river system. It's uh, uh, from a time when the Sahara was home to a nice tropical ocean. Um, so yeah, so we go to different environments, but typically we look for river deposits. All right, so Nazar, something the students might not know is that it's pretty lucky if you are fossilized. You have to, to die in the right place, the right conditions. That's why uh, sometimes it's hard to find fossils. What you're looking for is uh, there's a certain set of circumstances that has to happen for a fossil to be preserved. Yep. All right. Let's see. We need to visit Mr. Kozakzinski's group. They're hanging out in Canton, Michigan. Let's get their microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Michigan? <laughs> My teacher showed us that crocodiles lived before T-Rex. Why did they survive when other dinosaurs went extinct? Good question. So um, crocodiles have been around for a very long time. Uh, one thing to, to, to remember though is that the crocodiles we look at from you know many, many millions of years ago are not the same crocodiles as the ones that are still around today. Uh, but they're relatives, they're kind of like cousins of modern crocodiles, if you like. Um, so this group of crocs has been around for a long time. Um, and at the end of the age of dinosaurs, when a big meteorite hit our planet and other things happened too, there's volcanism and sea level changes. And anyway, dinosaurs went extinct. Um, many other groups were also badly hit. So, you know, crocodiles also... Uh, didn't do very well. Only a uh, small number survived, only small ones that could kind of survive the harsh conditions. Um, and so that's why crocs are still around. But, you know, um, all animal groups were affected by the extinction event. And sometimes it's just down to luck. Uh, in this particular case, large animals went extinct. Only very small ones survived, including uh, your very own little ancestors, little furry mammals. They made it through that extinction event. Um, one thing I should add, though, is that dinosaurs did not all go extinct because, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, birds are surviving dinosaurs. So this branch of the dinosaur tree, if you like, made it through the extinction event. And so, you know, a few representatives of these groups, crocodiles, dinosaurs, mammals, and so on, made it through the extinction event. All right. Very cool. Great question from our group in Michigan. This time we're going to visit Mrs. Black's class. They're joining us from Topeka in Kansas. Let's get that microphone on. How are we doing, Kansas? Hi. Cool. All right. Who's up? Um, my name is Hunter. Um, what kind of tools do you use to find fossils and skeletons? Very good question. Um, so we use many different kinds of tools. Uh, sometimes we use really big tools. So we might use a jackhammer to remove really hard rock. Um, and then we might use, you know, big hammers and ch chisels. Um, but then, you know, after we remove the big heavy rocks, we use, you know, brushes to remove um, sediment and sand. 
Um, and, you know, and then sometimes we use very small tools. We might use, you know, sharp tools to kind of remove little bits of rock or sediment. Um, and once we bring fossils back to the lab uh, and they have to be prepared out of the rock, um, then the preparators, the fossil preparators use very, very delicate tools, a little bit, things that look a bit like dentist tools to remove tiny little grains of sediment. So it takes a lot of work to get all of the sediment and rock off a fossil. All right. All right. Oops, we're getting a little feedback. There we go. So I want to grab a question from online. Mr. Lee's class is joining us in North Hollywood in California. And it's are they're wondering if you can tell them about maybe one or two of the new species you've discovered. <laughs> well, I can tell you about some. <laughs> um, we found some new flying reptiles, pterosaurs. So I showed you one. Um, and just a few years ago we knew very little about the pterosaurs the flying reptiles of the sahara and and really all of africa we just had a few bones and you could fit those bones on a small little table uh, but over the last few years um, we put together a larger and larger collection and we now have hundreds of pterosaur fossils and so we were able to identify several new species of pterosaurs and that's pretty cool um, they all look a little different they have different slightly different jaws and so what that tells us is that they were probably feeding on different things. They're all specialized. Uh, and you see that in some birds today, you know, some birds have big beaks to crack open nuts or, you know, and others have um, narrower beaks. And then we see the same thing in pterosaurs, different kinds of jaws, which allowed many different species of pterosaurs to exist in the same environment. They were not competing for the same food. All right, let's go to another classroom. Mrs. Edwards group is joining us. Uh, they're in the US. I believe they're in Colorado, but I bet they'll correct me if I'm wrong. How are we doing, Miss Edwards group? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Yes. My name is Emma and I'm wondering, do you ever find DNA in a dinosaur and match some of it with living DNA in this time? So do we ever find DNA of dinosaurs? Um, that's a really good question. And it's a tricky one. Um, we know that some people have suggested that they found like tiny little fragments. Um, and, and that tells us something. We can compare some of this very limited information to birds, for example, and, and other uh, living animals to see how similar this information is to dinosaurs, but nothing like what you would need to build a Jurassic Park and to kind of, you know, recreate a dinosaur. Because the thing is, DNA is not very stable and it falls apart pretty easily and pretty rapidly. So, um, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to bring back dinosaurs using a very ancient DNA. Um, although maybe it's a, it's, it's a good thing. I don't know if dinosaurs would be very happy living in our world today. All right, I think I'm gonna to have to agree with you on, on that one. I think they find it a very different place. And uh, yeah, I don't think it would be very fun for them. All right, yep. Mrs. Salazar's class is hanging out with us in Texas. Let me see if I can get their microphone turned on. How are we doing, Texas? Good. All right, nice and loud. Who's got a question for us? Would you think that your major rediscovery of the Spinosaurus is one of your greatest achievements in your profession, if not the best? Um, it's certainly up there. Um, and, you know, I think the reason why this one kind of stands out is because it's such a bizarre dinosaur. You know, sometimes you find remains of a dinosaur and that's pretty cool, but it kind of looks pretty similar to other dinosaurs that have, uh, that have already been described. Uh, with Spinosaurus, we really had something very, very unusual on our hands. So yes, I think that's, it's certainly true to say that Spinosaurus always has a, you know, a special place in my heart for sure. So Nazar, since we do have a couple minutes, um, some of the classrooms, it sounds like Mrs. Uh, Salazar's class in Texas might know a little bit of the story of kind of the, the rediscovery of that specific fossil, that specific site. Can you share maybe like a 
two, three minute version of that story? Well, um, yeah, I can, I can give you a, a short um, version of this. Um, Spinosaurus is, is, is a really uh, enigmatic dinosaur because um, the first skeleton of Spinosaurus was uncovered a very, very long time ago, over 100 years ago, uh, by a pioneering German paleontologist. And he had not found a complete skeleton, just you know, some of the bones, including these big, tall spines. Um, and he also uncovered a number of other dinosaurs from the Sahara. And he brought all these fossils back to Munich in southern Germany. And these were really spectacular discoveries, you know, kind of one of a kind discoveries. And they're housed in this big, grand museum. Uh, but then the museum was obliterated, it was destroyed in World War II. And all of these dinosaurs were lost, including the only skeleton of Spinosaurus. And so for many, many, many years, people have tried to find a new Spinosaurus. Um, rediscovering Spinosaurus required some um, extreme determination and an, an incredible stroke of good luck. Um, the story has been told in, um, you know, in a National Geographic special, it's called Big, Bigger Than T-Rex. So you're all welcome to check that out. It's a Nova National Geographic special. Um, but that's why this was such a special discovery, you know, rediscovering uh, a dinosaur that had been lost seemingly forever. All right. I know that was that I put you on the spot with a short, because it is a big story. It's a really cool story. So uh, classrooms, you, if you have time, I bet you can track it down. Uh, in Nat Geo, you can probably search online and find the story. It is really a cool story. It's some good luck, some good detective work. Uh, it's a great story. So I suggest you track it down uh, if you can, classrooms. So Nazar, I think we have a couple more minutes. Um, yep. We're going to visit a couple more classrooms before we wrap up for today. I think I see someone front and center in Mrs. Edwards' class. So let's turn their mic on one more time. Um, what is the biggest fossil you have found? The biggest fossil I have found um, was probably this giant uh, arm bone we found of the plant-eating dinosaur. This is uh, uh, this thing was so heavy, you know, you need four people just to lift it, and we found it on a mountain. So we had to carry this massive, massive bone down a mountain, um, and it is uh, to this day, I think, the largest dinosaur bone ever found in this part of the Sahara. All right, so we only have a couple more minutes, but if you give me a wave in your classroom or send someone right to the front, that'll be my signal that we have to visit one more time. Let's go to Michigan first. If I wanted to be a paleontologist, what should I study at school? Well, um, science is certainly very important. Um, you need some math, uh, but you know, biology is, I would say the most important um, as I said, if you want to understand, um, you know, ancient animals, so let me show you one, you know, here's one. You know what this is? This is a saber-toothed cat, saber-toothed cat skull. If you want to understand this animal, uh, you probably need to understand the biology of, you know, a lion or a tiger. So you really need um, some understanding of uh, living animals too. So, you know, the study of animals, zoology, biology, those are all important topics. Um, geology can also be important, the study of rocks, um, but even things that are not directly related to science, like languages can be great. You know, I speak several languages and as a scientist, I think it's really um, beneficial to speak several languages. So, you know, there are a number of things you can use, but science is certainly the most important one and, and biology, I would say, the most important topic in science. All right. Great advice. We're going to head back to Louisiana. Let me turn Mrs. Gilpin's microphone on. We're ready. Could Spinosaurus breathe underwater? Could Spinosaurus breathe underwater? Uh, we think that Spinosaurus would have to go to the surface. Um, the, the nose opening in Spinosaurus is way back on the skull. So what, what Spinosaurus could do is plunge its snout in the water and still breathe as long as this little nose opening is sticking out of the water. So it could kind of plunge half its snout in the water and maybe wait for fish to swim by and then catch the fish. Um, but, you know, it was not a fully, you know, it, it wasn't a fish, you know. 
Uh, it was still a dinosaur. It was a dinosaur mostly at home in water, but it wasn't a fish. All right. And give me a wave if I should come back to your classroom. Let me see if there's another group. Oh, let's go back to Texas. Your microphone's on. Yeah, Texas. Um, what precautionary measures did you and your team have to go through to, you know, be safe? Uh, what did we have to do to be safe? So I always tell my team members to, you know, wear good solid shoes uh, because we do a lot of really difficult climbing. Um, so you had really good hiking boots um, so that you don't slide down one of these, these steep slopes. Uh, and it also protects you from snake bites and, and so on. You know, be careful when you're picking up rocks. There could be scorpions or snakes underneath. Um, I make sure that people don't just wander off on their own. We should always, you know, be in pairs at least or in larger groups. Um, always stay hydrated, especially when you're out there in July, as, as we did this summer. Um, you know, you have to drink a lot, take electrolytes. Uh, so those are the most important pieces of advice. As I said, sometimes we need military protection, but that's a, you know, that's a different story. But the more immediate dangers are things like dehydration um, and, you know, falling off a, a steep escarpment. All right, and Mrs. Black's class, take us home. One more question from Kansas. Hi, my name is Kira. I have a question. Do you guys look for fossils in the ocean? Do we look for fossils in the ocean? Um, I don't, but there are parts of the world where you can actually, if you have like a, a, a trawler or a net that, that kind of scoops up things from the bottom of the sea, you can dredge up uh, bones of uh, animals, not as old as dinosaurs, but things that would have been very similar to things you might have seen in, in movies like Ice Age or something like that. So sometimes you can find ancient remains of animals um, and, and, and get them from underwater. But uh, uh, I always go to very dry places in the deserts. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I want to give a huge shout out to our classrooms. You guys were awesome today. Thanks for all the great questions, both our classrooms on YouTube and our classrooms right on camera with us. Don't forget, if you took some pictures, post those online, tag at Nat Geo Education, hashtag explore classroom. And Nizar, it's always so awesome we get to steal some of your time. Uh, it's great to see your work. It's always exciting to hear that there's more coming to us in the future. And hopefully one of the next times we get you out in the field because that would be lots of fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And yes, great questions, really good questions today. All right, awesome. Well, the last thing we'll do, I'm going to unmute the microphones. Boys and girls, let's get loud, big goodbye and thank you, and then we'll sign off for today. So here we go. <laughs>